tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about coming-of-age carnage and new kid nightmares. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Sean Kruger and TJ Lee are voice talents Nick Goroff, Heather Thomas, and Vaden. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. Remember the old days when video games were so new and exciting it was almost decadent to play them? Feeding dollars into the change machine at the local arcade, your pants falling down from the weight of the quarters, remember that? I do. Begging at the VHS rental place to be the next on the list to rent Double Dragon? Remember drooling over your neighbor's gold-gilded Zelda cartridge? It'd run you 69 bucks at Toys R Us to get one of your own, and if you accidentally turned it off without holding the reset button, you were screwed. Back to the beginning with your wooden sword, remember that? If you do, there's a good chance you're a seasoned gamer like me. You remember the pattern to get Link through the Lost Woods. You know the Konami code by heart. Likewise, the Nintendo Power Hotline number. Your thumbs have their own biceps and are spiked with calluses so thick thick, you could hold them on a stove top. And most importantly, you're an individual of fine taste. Like me. That's why I'm excited to tell you about my newest obsession, Best Fiends. Best Fiends! It's a match 3 style puzzle slash adventure game for Apple and Android platforms and it's an absolute blast. There's something about match 3 games that's gratifying to the core. And this one's the best I've played. Here's the gist of it. The fiends are the good guys, and your object is to match objects to deal damage and defeat the slugs, the baddies. And here's an aspect I love. You're playing through an actual storyline, not just grinding for levels. Along the way, you'll build your team of fiends, unlock achievements, and solve increasingly harder puzzles. Thousands of puzzles, in fact, with more and more added all the time. Your fiends begin the game as babies, but as you crush your way through the bad guys, your fiends will grow and become more powerful. You'll collect gold, upgrade and evolve your characters, find keys and unlock treasures. It's constant gratification, the kind of game that'll have you always wanting to play just one more level. And if you're anything like me, which we've already established you are, you'll be absolutely glued to it. It's really tough to put down, and with no data or Wi-Fi required to play, you can enjoy it absolutely anywhere. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? It's free to download. So what's stopping you? 100 million gamers have downloaded Best Fiends, and you can too. Sure, video games are nothing like they were in the past, but remember how much fun we had back then? 
Best Fiends is a game for adults that will have you feeling like a kid again. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Sean Kruger and is performed by Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's voice talent, Nick Goroff. In it, we will be introduced to a group of three boys who just finished their first year of high school. They set off to recreate the plot of Stephen King's iconic Stand By Me and begin their quest hiking along the old railway trail in hopes of catching a glimpse of ghost legend Mary Rutherford. Without further ado, I present to you what lurks behind. My family still visits now and then. They check in, a text once every so often, an email. I don't blame them. They act concerned, but keep just enough distance not to become wrapped up in the stench that follows me. My parents still hold on to a glimmer of hope that the story has a pleasant ending. Their belief in me disintegrates with every passing day in this hellhole. I mean, they understand something happened, but just not my version of events. Dread consumes me. The familiar ritual of sleeping pills and whiskey helps me sleep through the night. That is one good thing about my parents. On special occasions, like Christmas, they slip a bottle of Jack under my mattress. Psychologists diagnosed me with schizophrenia, a long-term psychological disorder. They claim I withdraw from reality and become delusional sometimes. The doctors desire to put a label on this burden I carry. I presume it is a professional requirement. My name is David Krieg. Myself and two others experienced a foreboding event that shaped my awareness of what genuine horror is. Today the doctors felt they made some progress. I gave them a bit of conversation, and the doctors feel a sense of pride and accomplishment. You see, Everyone in this loony bin is crazy. Well, except me, of course. I am the perfect specimen because my story is true. That is how it works around here. If the doctors don't see progress, they feel like failures. Being a failure means more sessions, treatments, and mind-numbing antipsychotics. So today was a pleasant day. The warm weather allowed us to be outside, and with summer around the corner, the orderlies permitted the season's first bonfire in the courtyard. I was in my sedentary position on the bench when my phone lit up. It was my longtime friend Vern dialing me up. He wanted to talk about the old railway trail hike in the summer of grade nine. Our conversation opened memories locked in my subconscious vault, memories my doctors want me to forget. It was supposed to be one of those coming-of-age experiences. The movie Stand By Me had just come out in theaters, and somehow Vern, myself, and our friend Michael were compelled to recreate the plot. The movie is about four boys in 1959 Castle Rock, Oregon, who go on a hike to find the dead body of a missing boy. The only difference, Stand By Me, ends when the credits roll up the screen. Summer was finally here, the first year of high school was not so bad. The discovery of girls and Jack Daniels made this new chapter in our life seem adventurous. It was also where I met two lifelong pals. Vern and Michael knew each other from going to the same grade school together, and I was the kid from the country that rode the bus. We hooked up one day during lunch when I was looking for a place to sit in the crowded cafeteria. Vern yelled to me, Hey, buddy. Need a place to sit? 
We met earlier that morning in science class. From that point on, I sat in the same spot beside my two friends for the rest of the school year. It was during those lunch hours that we planned our trip. The school year ended, and we were none the wiser. We met the night before our trip at Michael's house to pack and get organized. Michael was a perfectionist and the mastermind behind our journey. I had a restless night's sleep, but the thrill and freedom we adolescents had with this trip made the tiredness rush from your body. Michael's mom dropped us off at the starting point, about 20 miles from the nearest town. The old railway trail travels the distance of Bruce County, scraping the cliffs of Island Bay. The views are breathtaking, but the trek is dangerous. Not only do you have to worry about the hundred-foot cliffs, but the genuine fear was finding Mary Rutherford. As legend reveals, she committed suicide after being stood up at the altar. Her rundown cabin is just a few steps from the trail, and our mission was to find her grave. Mary haunts those who try to find her. She travels through the forest wearing her mangled up wedding gown, torn from decades of searching for a husband. After a few hours of backpacking through the rugged terrain, we landed on top of the highest cliff. This is where we had our first sit down and chug of water from our canteens. The clouds were rolling in, and we were about five miles from our first Michael organized campsite. Looks like a storm is brewing, Vern commented after leaning his backpack against a tree. I remember wanting to get moving and get our camp set up before night fell. My focus was on the sky. Black clouds painted the sky and blocked out the sun. Vern was still talking when I peered over to Michael. He was standing like a statue, staring into the dense forest upon which we came. Shh. Michael held a finger to his mouth. Do you hear that, fellows? Something is in those woods behind us. Mary Rutherford, perhaps, I replied with a giggle. No. I'm serious, he responded. Michael was a pensive character, and was not in the mood for jokes. Vern and I sauntered over to where he was standing. We heard some cracking of twigs and a faint moan. What the... Vern interrupted me before I could finish. Come on, let us get moving before whatever that is gets any closer. We agreed took a last sip of water, grabbed our packs, and hurried to the trail. We were young and immature, and not as brave as we thought. We arrived at our first camp in just over two hours. I hurried up and set our tent as we could hear the thunder in the distance. The other two searched nearby for some kindling and dry firewood. There were remnants of a previously burned fire pit, formed from some rocks, most likely from the trail. The coals were cold, and the site appeared to have no visitors for an exceptionally long time. The thick forest was on three sides of us, and the tent faced Island Bay. Mikey, what's for dinner? I'm starving, Vern asked. I have a surprise. Burgers from your old man's chip wagon. Vern's dad owned a local chip truck. Vern worked Saturday afternoons, and I would always visit him looking for a free burger and fries. To us, the place was world famous, and Vern's dad must have donated some frozen patties for our adventure. As the thunder became more deafening, Michael built a protective shelter of large branches over our fire pit. This allowed us to have a fire in the rain, for a while anyway. Vern placed the burgers on a small grill we brought asked me for the matches. It took a few minutes, but we had a fire in no time. Vern cooked the meal, and Michael and I chatted about what grotesque creature might have been in the forest during our last stop. As quickly as the burgers came off the grill, we stuffed them in our faces. We were starving like most teenage boys, and had no one there to judge our eating habits. The rain hammered down. Lucky for us, Michael's fire shelter worked perfectly. It was an eerie sight, watching the glow of the fire with rain in the background. 
With each of us propped up against a rock, we continued our chat about who or what might be prowling in the surrounding trees. Well, guys, I am not kidding. Maybe the legend is true. Mary Rutherford's shack is up here somewhere in these woods. Her final resting place can't be far, and I'm sure the old oak tree where she hung herself is standing still, Fern suggested. We continued with the teenaged boy chatter for another hour. By this time, it was pitch black, and all you could see was a perimeter reaching only as far as the glow from the fire allowed. We'd hear the gentle rain shake the leaves on the trees. We were deep into our stories when a rock the size of a baseball came rolling through our lighted area. I froze at that moment as the hairs on the back of my neck stood tall. Fear crept through my spine, but I was too frightened to scream. The three of us looked at each other with shock as it silenced our voices. From the direction in which the stone came, the rain sounded different. I would best describe it as a muffle. The rain was landing quietly, almost being absorbed, virtually silent. Michael picked up his flashlight and pointed it in the vicinity. The light picked up a silhouette of a human body. The rain outlined it perfectly. The humanoid figure was pointing in the direction in which we were heading. I think it's trying to tell us something, Vern said in a panicked, stricken tone. Turn it off! Turn it off! I repeated. Michael clicked off the flashlight, and I could see our petrified faces in the gleam of the fire. I remember sitting there for almost an hour. Nobody spoke, moved, or blinked. The rain continued, but this time even harder. The storm finally hit, and it soaked the fire. Michael headed first into the tent as his sleeping bag was furthest away from the door. Vern and I followed. The only words spoken were, I want to go home. I was so terrified. It was about 3.30 when Vern's old man's burgers wreaked havoc on my digestive system. There was still a continuous downpour of rain. I woke up with my head welded to the pillow from my tears. Needing to get outside for some fresh air, I grabbed Michael's flashlight from the damp floor of the tent. I tapped, hitting the light till it showed some displays of life. Vern was snoring like a drunken sailor as I carefully stepped over his lying body. I quickly unzipped the door and slid into my boots. I crawled through the opening, stumbled to my feet, and shone the light into the tent. I noticed Michael was not in his sleeping bag. The lump of his dad's old hunting bedroll was open. The lump of his dad's old hunting bedroll was open, and the underside exposed printed deer and hunting images. My mind started racing, reviewing all the reasons where he would be. At first, my thoughts were logical. He had to slip out and take a leak, or worse, felt the indigestion of Vern's undercooked burgers. A simple reason till I noticed his hiking boots were still at the door. Not to mention, I had the group's only flashlight. Michael's flashlight. Did he slip on a saturated rock and tumble over the cliff? I frantically began searching the area in and around our campsite. This fucking rain, I mumbled as the cool rain condensed into an eerie patch of mist rising from below the rock cliffs. I called out to him only to have my voice muffled from the downpour. After a few minutes, which felt like hours, I heard the most blood-curdling scream. It ripped through me like a piece of shard glass. My stomach felt twisted, and I could feel the pulse in my neck ready to explode. Michael Jesus, is that you? I called in the direction in which the horror sound came from. With caution, I briskly walked towards Michael's shrieks. Not knowing what I was going to find, I continued to call out to him. His screams of agony led me deeper into the forest and eventually to an old, run-down cabin. One would describe the cabin as rancid, vile, and disgusting. I tore the doorway open, allowing the scent of decay to linger over the entire property. Amongst the hand-hewed log walls sits a broken-down stone fireplace 
with the initials M and M scratched into the mantel. Sitting below the fireplace was an old wooden chest. The hasp had rusted away, leaving easy access to the contents. Sealed in a plastic bag and tightly wrapped in barn twine revealed some old letters and newspapers. I grabbed the brittle newspapers and stuffed them down the back of my pants. If I ever find Michael, the newspaper will make perfect kindling to start a much-needed campfire. That's a big if, I whispered. The rain wreaked havoc on my search. It pounded on the tin roof, creating a hypnotizing sound that forced my mind into a state of hallucinations. With every moment, I heard unfamiliar sounds. Sounds of torture and agony. The smell of burning flesh filled my nostrils, and with every angle of my flashlight appeared Michael. He was screaming, Kill me! Kill me! From corner to corner I aimed my light. There he was, but only for a second. I cried out to him, my body becoming paralyzed as an icy grip surrounded me. The force lifted me and threw me through a broken out window. There was a sudden stop of rain, a sea of calm, as if before the storm. I staggered to my feet and searched as far as the flashlight would reach. Dazed and confused, I explored my surroundings. With soft steps, I walked towards what looked like the backyard. The property appeared to have several large oak trees, but only one caught my attention. A monstrous looking tree reaches high into the sky. The mammoth oak almost appears human, with pointy limbs for arms and an oddly shaped peak. The fractured peak resembles a broken neck that eerily keeps watch over the cabin. It gives you the sense something terrible is about to happen as it sits atop Island Bay Cliffs. From one of the lower branches, I noticed an old broken piece of rope. The frayed rope stayed motionless as I approached it. After a few steps, I heard Michael cry out once again and my thoughts became refocused on saving him. His desperate and terrorizing voice haunted me to my core. I pointed my flashlight towards his moans, coming from just behind the rope tree. At first, when my light hit Michael, he was on his hands and knees, arms reaching out for me to hold him. His eyes melted shut as he moaned with blood-covered hands. Kill me! Kill me! Kill me! He cried out. My voice was frozen in my terrified lungs. As Michael kneeled there, helpless, I noticed a figure standing behind him. Based on the legends, I recognized it as Mary Rutherford. Her face was pitted with burrowing insects, and my nostrils filled with the smell of rotting flesh. She was dressed in a torn wedding gown, with a noose around her neck, confirming all the stories. Her face was a blackened, lifeless skull and her eyes had been picked clean, likely from the same vultures that currently fly above my head. Michael screamed out again, and it was at that point I noticed her exceptionally long arms. She had them pierced into the middle of Michael's back like swords. He cried out again as the decaying limbs pulled him towards her decomposing body. Her arms cauterized Michael's chest as they cut it, burning his flesh like in a crematorium. The arms tangled back in through his mouth, hushing his screams. Michael's limp body was melting into Mary Rutherford's demon corpse. All that was left was his deformed head, protruding out of the side of the corpse bride, almost like a trophy. Once the torture stopped, an eerie calm stilled the night, her appetite for death satisfied. She lifted her hand and pointed towards our campsite. With my heart racing, I ran, dropping the flashlight. I wasn't about to stick around and look for it either. After a few running steps, I tripped and found myself at the bottom of a gaping hole. My sheer adrenaline allowed me to claw my way out. At the top of the hole was a stone monument. Without my light, 
I could feel letters inscribed on the face. Here lies Mary Rutherford, died of a broken heart. May she find what she's been looking for in heaven. I sprinted as fast as my adolescent legs would go, eventually reaching the tent. I screamed for Vern to wake up. He popped his head out through the entrance. You okay, man? Where's Mikey? No, I'm not okay. We need to get moving now. Something has happened to Michael. He's dead, Vern. Dead, I repeated. The severity of the situation registered with Vern just then. He knew something had gone dreadfully wrong. He figured getting help would be the best course of action. I just needed to get the hell away from that grotesque being that absorbed my friend. We waited for the first light and then hiked our way out. Vern thought I had been through too much and didn't believe me when I looked back towards her cabin. There I got one last glance. Mary Rutherford was pointing in the direction to the end of the trail, as if telling us to leave. Sometimes things are more disturbing in the sun's light. After we started walking, a family of raccoons ran out in front of us, a group of six or seven. I could not tell as they were moving extremely fast, heading in the same direction as us. They disappeared in a flash down the trail. A second later, there was a family of skunks, followed by a herd of deer. Animals of all species were leaving the area. We even saw a mother black bear and her cubs, oblivious to us. We double-timed our stride, almost keeping up with the raccoons. I heard noises behind us, constant moaning. I called out Michael's name. Vern knew I needed help. Branches were being broken and the distinctive smell of Mary Rutherford was all around us. Between the marathon and my sense of fear, my heart was pounding from my chest. Before we knew it, we had traveled almost the distance of the trail. The end was near. There was a sense of civilization at the rendezvous point, a little picnic shelter just off the main road, washrooms, and a pay farm. This is where we called the police. The rain poured once again, Puddles were overflowing, and there was about a foot of water in the shelter. We stood up on top of the picnic tables, making sure not to be standing in the tiny river below us. Vern held me like a baby while we waited for help. I didn't say much. I really didn't know what to say. I would have to tell the cops and my parents and... Oh, God. Michael's parents. Minutes turned to hours. Vern and I were starving, and contemplated calling the cops again when the strangest thing happened. The earth shook, trees uprooted, and a horrendous noise echoed for miles. The forest cried out like an animal in distress. All I could hear was the cracking of granite. It was hard to see through the downpour of rain, but in a moment's glance, the entire twenty-mile rock face broke off and slid into Island Bay. We were in a safe location when a police cruiser pulled up. He was worried about us as the news reported a major earthquake, causing the entire stretch of the old railway trail to break off. It was on national news as the slide crushed about four hunting cabins in the area. Vern keeps in touch. He checks in with my parents. It's been 34 years since I've last seen Michael since I have last seen Mary Rutherford. Her legend still lives on. The folktale includes stories of a run-down cabin, a grotesque-looking tree, and missing grade school kids longing for a thrill. I don't have to get into the details, as you've heard the story. I can hear the nurse coming. The clicking of her high heels gives her away every time. Another day. Another daily dose of sleeping pills and antipsychotics. Maybe tomorrow I will read the headlines from the old newspaper to my doctor. Then again, maybe not. Couple swept off cliff on wedding day earthquake. 
Michael Allen and Mary Rutherford were planning the wedding of their dreams when Mary was found battered and bruised, lying face down in the water. She was rushed to a hospital in stable condition. The search continues for Michael Allen. There was something about that summer of grade nine. Like Richard Dreyfus said in his last line of Stand By Me, I never had any friends later on like the ones I had when I was 12. Jesus. Does anyone? Held a special place in my heart. Vern has a family and an impressive career. Michael will forever be in our dreams. But for me, the dreams are my nightmares. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. No matter who you are or where you come from, no one gets through life without accumulating a little baggage. And we've all got some baggage, don't we? At least a carry-on bag's worth, maybe a fanny pack, but most, if not all of us, have something weighing us down. There's a reason just about everyone can benefit from counseling. When you make your way through life guided only by your past mistakes and disappointments, you're liable to miss your big flight. So what do you do with all this extra baggage? Sling it over your shoulder, continue limping through life, walk around in plain sight with a fanny pack on? There's a more dignified and adult way to handle your problems, friends, and it's quick, it's convenient, and it's affordable. It's better help. BetterHelp is a professional online counseling service that can help you check your baggage at the door. Whatever problems you're dealing with, depression, anxiety, relationship issues, or anything else standing between you and happiness, BetterHelp will match you with someone who specializes in your unique difficulties. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your very own licensed therapist. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. In short, you'll never be flying alone. Your personal counselor will always be close at hand. No awkward office visits necessary. It's the professional help you need right there in your pocket. And if you ask me, the finest innovation since modern aviation. BetterHelp is not a crisis line or a self-help. It's real professional counseling done online. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and financial aid is available for those who may need it. Whatever your situation, whatever your issues, with BetterHelp, you have the means to get better. So why tug around all that baggage when getting the help you need is so quick and easy? With over one million people using BetterHelp to make their lives better, it makes more sense than ever to get on board. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. BetterHelp is equipped and ready to provide just the help you need. So why wait? I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed What Lurks Behind, as written by Sean Kruger, and performed by the incomparable Chilling Tales for Dark Nights voice talent and evil idol champion, Nick Goroff. To find more of author Sean Kruger, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kruger, spelled K-R-U-E-G-E-R, -E -E and you'll be redirected to his author profile on creepypastastories.com, where you can find his Amazon page. If you do check him out there, be sure to look up his novel called The Cabin Shadows. David Krieg is an unusual individual. 
diagnosed with schizophrenia shortly after his annual boys fishing trip. David tells us the story of the life-changing events of that 20th year at Gusty Lake. The mid-40-somethings find themselves wrapped up in a world of strange beings called shadows. Chalet Camaraderie sits on a secluded lake in the northern part of Quebec, Canada. The cabin carries secrets that David discovers might hold the key to another world. David finds himself a victim of circumstance and ends up disappearing for a week. His return to a disbelieving world of exploitive press and self-presented debunkers pushes David to a brink of insanity. All David wants is to tell his story and complete his mission. And if you enjoyed Mr. Goroff's performance, you can hear more of him on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel. Be sure to let him know you heard him here. You won't be sorry that you did. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by T.J. Lee and performed by Heather Thomas and Vaden. It's never easy being a new student in a new school. In this tale, we'll meet Zoe Hartwell, the new girl. We accompany her as she struggles to navigate through adapting to a new school in a new community, a community that's very different indeed. Now, without further ado, I present to you, No Name November. Sorry, new kid, but you're last in today, so you're our candidate this year. The kid in front of our classroom door relaying this to me looked a mixture of pity and relief. His nose taped over and a black eye, an immediate standout feature. I was later told his name was Frank, and the damage was a result of a fight with the kid in the grade above us for calling his mom a slut. He didn't make eye contact with me directly, instead drawing his attention to my shirt, a Legend of Zelda fan art piece adorning the center. Man, this sucks. We could have been friends. The slight hurt in his voice was not even remotely close to how shut out I was already feeling. First day in a new school, desperate for a fresh start, and doing my best to make a good impression. Totally out the window. This doesn't seem fair, I protested, knowing this may just be an elaborate prank on the new girl. I wasn't about to deal with being a joke on day one. Look, let me introduce myself. My name is Zoe Hart. He shook his head some of his friends seated in the class behind him leaning forward, genuine shock rippling across their faces, as if I'd bitten the head off a small animal. No, this isn't how it works, new kid. This isn't just a class thing. It's a community thing. He looked back hesitantly, and the class nodded, no semblance of glee or cruelty on their face. I dare say for a bunch of 12-year-olds, they were downright forlorn at the prospect. He sighed and continued. Our town has this every November, and the rules are simple. The last one into a community function is no name for the month. He leans in and speaks quietly. Just bear with it, and we'll be friends afterwards, okay? I'm sorry, I really am. With that, he takes his seat and I shuffled into the room, a sea of completely apathetic faces staring straight ahead. I'd made an effort to look my best self in spite of a new environment, hoping it would make a good impression. But instead of being invited to speak by the teacher, the room fell silent until I sat down at the back, next to a fogged over window and a small supply cupboard. I was in disbelief that the teacher joined in on it, not glancing in my direction or checking her register to see if I was present. Even after the bell rang and we went to recess or lunch, I was a non-entity. People didn't walk through me or shove me out of the way, but they didn't go out of their way to assist me if I fell over or give me alternative food when I brought up that my file says I have a deathly allergy to peanuts. 
Every fiber of me wanted to cry, to scream that I was desperate to be acknowledged and that I wouldn't hurt anyone. But I choked back the emotions piling up in my throat, slung my bag over my shoulder, and resolved to just read or play some video games on my recess, if this is how it was going to be. Different schools, different traditions, same bullshit. My parents had jobs in the journalism industry, and moving around for promotions or alternative contracts was their forte. By the time I was nearly 13, I had moved to five different schools, and I'd become accustomed to the changes. Most kids become jaded and try not to make connections with others, knowing they'll just be gone in a year or less anyway. But I had this innate desire to connect with people and make the most of my situation. I couldn't help myself. That's what made this so much harder. I probably would have caved in after day two if Phil hadn't shown up. It was the beginning of what already felt like a lifelong routine. I sat down at my desk and began to let my mind wander, focusing on what I'd enjoy playing when I got home. Making some comfort food and joining my mom at the gym after, so I didn't feel gross. I idly doodled a sketch of me holding the master's sword high, a bolt of lightning striking at the hilt and electrifying me in a comical fashion. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. What's your favorite game in the series? I'd say mine is the newest one. My mom got it for me last Christmas, but I haven't had a chance to play in a while. The jubilant voice cut through the air, as if a firecracker had been let off by my ear, his positivity irradiating through me and borderline making me jump out of my seat with excitement and confusion. Startled at the notion of someone talking to me, I snap my pencil and the entire room freezes. The boys at the front next to Frankie turn to him and whisper, the slightest of side glances in my direction, and they shake their heads at the both of us before turning back. I turn to look at him and I see a mess of spiky black hair, a dusty red flannel shirt with sleeves underneath, the sweatshirt logo of a Dark Souls reference. He looks like a kid completely out of time, but very comfortable in himself. He smiles at me and seems to be waiting for my reply. But for that brief moment, words had failed me. Huh. T Twilight Princess. I stammer, my hands fumbling over one another. I... I really like the dark plot and Midna is so, so cool. I'm confused, but the joy of conversation overtakes me and I decide that if I'm going to be ignored for tradition's sake, I may as well get it over with now. I'm Zoe, by the way. Zoe Hartwell. But instead of being repulsed, his eyes light up. He beams at me, offering a hand adorned with various faded concert tags and festival markers. I'm Phil Faulty. Good to meet you, man. He gives me a fist bump before leaning back on his chair. The hinges squeak as he puts the rubber of his pencil to his lips, tapping it contemplatively as he studies me. The lesson around us seems to continue without any notice of our discussion. You're the new no-name, aren't you? He says after a few moments. My face sags and I feel the inevitable rejection imminently approaching. Yeah? I guess you don't want to be friends now, huh? I say my body language matching my face as I hunch over my work, preparing to just draw silently for the rest of the day. A friendship, dead on arrival. To my surprise, he leans forward with a satisfying thump and turns toward me, still smiling. Nah, I was no name last year. I know how it goes. He declares, almost matter-of-factly, the positivity refusing to leave his voice. But Frank and his friends said that this is tradition, I replied, nudging my head towards him as he took notes from the class. He didn't seem like a nasty kid, so much as one caught up doing what was asked of him. Phil made an audible acknowledgement before turning back to me. Well, he's not wrong. This is tradition, but 
well, I always wished I had a friend throughout that shit, and I guess I just want to do it for you, you know? I immediately felt more comfortable around him, and the more he spoke, the bolder I felt. Won't they, like, cast you out again permanently, or beat you up? He laughed, shaking his head. Nah, nothing like that. But even if there were punishments, it wouldn't matter. I'm not really all that acknowledged around here lately anyway, so no harm done. He patted my shoulder before the bell rang, and the class shuffled out for lunch. I saw a chance to bond and decided I had nothing to lose. Phil? I brought lunch from home since the stuff here I'm allergic to. Want to split it and play some Animal Crossing? He smiled so sincerely, nodding silently as I grabbed my stuff before heading for the door. What happens if you eat the food here? Does your head swell up and burst? He asked, imitating the sound of a popping balloon with blood chunks spraying everywhere. I laughed for the first time since I got to this town. <laughs> no, nothing like that. I just choke and die without an EpiPen. Come on, let's go. I'll even let you visit my town. If you promise not to dig holes in the garden. I say, teasing him with a jovial grin. I wouldn't dream of it. There's never anything good to find secret holes anyway. He dryly replies before shoving me and laughing at his own terrible joke. The next two weeks were comparable bliss to those first few days. While the rest of the class refused to acknowledge me, and even some store attendants around town would only take my money and nothing more. I felt it to be tolerable with Phil by my side. He'd show me around the school and tell me all the best hiding spots, sharing legends I was 99% certain he made up to impress me, but I didn't care. He made me feel like I mattered, and it was something I steadily realized very few people had done in my life to that point. I took it to heart, and made a point to ask my parents and my older brother in college about their days, spend more time with them, and learn things I'd never thought to ask about before. As we reached the end of the month, I decided to make him a drawing of the two of us hanging out in a treehouse filled with treasures and weapons. Some days before, he confessed Adventure Time was one of his favorite shows to me, and how much he missed it since he didn't get cable anymore. As the final days of No Name November were in sight, I was determined to show my gratitude to him, and remind him we were best friends after this was over too, even if that meant he was stuck with me. I made my way down the hall. I was running late thanks to a doctor's appointment, and the silence was as unsettling as the details you often ignore when your mind is occupied by conversations, drama, and the walk to your next lesson. Now, I was conscious of the echo my footsteps made, the tributes to someone on the walls across the lockers, flowers and spikes covering one person's locker further down the hall from my room. I decided I'd take a look later on, and maybe Phil could shed some light on what had happened. I came into the sound of utter silence, the entire group already deep in reading time, and the teacher herself perusing what looked like an Edgar Allan Poe novel. I sheepishly made my way back to where Phil sat, his back against the supply closet, and anxiety painted across his face. Dude, what's wrong? Did the girl you like look in your direction? <laughs> Dork. I said playfully punching him and smiling, something he did not reciprocate. In the years following this, I have never seen such a paradoxical expression. He was anxious, miserable, and accepting all at once, as if each face was jostling for the spotlight on his face, and he was powerless to control which one came out. He flashed me a smile before a grimace replaced it his knee twitching incessantly. Zoe, I'm leaving today. I'm being transferred. He looked so ashamed of himself, but didn't break his eye contact with me, 
I knew from the moment we spoke that I'd be leaving at the end of this month. But I wanted so, so badly to stay with you and be friends that I... I just... His eyes welled up and he sniffed, wiping them with his sleeve. I'm sorry. I was being selfish. I just didn't want you to think that I'd abandoned you when everyone else was still ignoring you. I didn't know how to respond. I wanted to yell at him for keeping it from me. To slap him, even. But I knew how important this last day was, and I took a deep breath before flexing my fingers on the table in front of me, grabbing my textbook and putting the drawing I made on his desk. The tension in his body ceased as he held it up and stared at it. For a moment, I couldn't see his face, but I could hear him whimpering. He held it to his chest and with his eyes closed, simply said, Thank you, Zoe. We spent that final day making terrible jokes at each other's expense, making plans to stay in touch that we knew we could never truly keep, and sharing a hug that lasted a little bit too long. His arm draped over my shoulders as we sat in the hall and waited out the last few minutes before the final period. I meant to ask. I saw something in the halls, and it looked like there was a kind of tribute on one of the lockers. What's that all about? I asked, knowing I'd probably forget if the school really did start talking to me soon after. Oh, that? That's my locker, he said matter-of-factly, twirling his spikes with his free hand. They heard I was leaving, and I guess they wanted to give me a good send-off. Pretty sweet, right? I've come a long way from just the kid in the crawl space. He laughed heartily, and I chuckled, not sure what he meant, and assuming it was an embarrassing time in his life, not wishing to pry. The bell rang, and we made our way to the door. Everyone else had already shuffled in, as we lingered outside, preferring to go in once the class had settled. If you don't mind, Zoe, I'm gonna dip here, he said, the positivity now with an air of reluctance. I felt my heart sink, but I nodded and wrapped my arms around him. You'll always be my best friend, Phil. No matter what else happens, okay? I said through muffled sobs as he chuckled. I know. You too. And hey, if you ever need to be reminded of me, you can just go to my hiding spot. You'll always be able to think of me that way. He took me by the shoulders and wiped the tears away, kissing my forehead. I felt a surge of butterflies as he smiled at me. Check the crawl space. You'll know what you're looking for. You've got a bright future ahead of you, though. Just make sure you're never studying alone, okay? You never know what kind of weirdos will try their luck, and you're too cool to end up with one of them. He flashed me a grin before backing off and running down the hallway, turning the corner, and disappearing from my life once and for all. I took a few moments to recompose myself before going back into the class, to the sound of thunderous applause and smiles. Every student that I would have once described as a gray shell of apathy now all full of their own vibrant colors. Freckles and curly hair jutting out at me, accents and body types I was oblivious to before now suddenly became immediately obvious. At the front, the teacher and Frank stood with smiles on their faces, Frank outstretching a hand that I took on autopilot. Congrats, Zoe. You made it to the end of No Name November and you didn't crack once. You're officially a member of the community now. He leaned in closer. And I'm honestly so sorry about this. I really did do want to be your friend, you know? I hope I can make it up to you. I looked at them with such confusion. Happy, but utterly bewildered by the display they'd put on. This is... this is great, and I'm glad we can all talk now, but isn't this for Phil? The room's atmosphere changed in an instant. Some students looked at me with terror, 
while others looked away. One girl began to tremble as her friend held her. Frank went pale and looked at me with a look I couldn't immediately place. Zoe, where did you hear that name? I half laughed, the prank obviously still not over. Dude, his locker is adorned outside, and he told me himself he was leaving. I assumed that's what all this was for. I waved my arms around the room, laughing. The room felt so cold as the teacher stood up, shaking as she approached me, kneeling down to my level and speaking in a low voice with an ungodly amount of severity. Zoe, this is really important. Where did you hear all this? I felt immediately on edge. I was obviously old enough to know something was wrong, and I wasn't the type to lie. If Phil is in trouble for skipping, I don't want to be the one to get him into crap before he starts his new school. I began, her eyes widening as she motioned to me to go outside with Frank, instructing the rest of the class to stay in there as we spoke outside. I could see Frank was shaking holding back tears as the teacher tried to calm him. Zoe, that locker isn't for Phil leaving. He went missing a year ago. Frank's voice was trembling, and his composure was rapidly failing him. He... He's my brother. I don't know what happened to him. But if you know anything... Anything at all, Zoe. Please. I never heard the register being called out in class, so I never noticed the last name. My niece felt weak. I never looked at the posters adorning the locker rooms that said, Missing since 2010. My stomach turned over and every emotion was turning into bile. I never inspected the locker that was covered in tributes from classmates and teachers. My vision began to blur as I leaned against the locker and began breathing heavily, the teacher trying to keep me calm as Frank looked on, confused but distraught. Supply closet? Crawl space? I breathed over and over as I felt my body give out and the sounds of rushing filled my ears before a series of frantic bangs, screaming, and alarms rang out to black. Phil had gone missing during his own nomination of No Name November. He'd been silently working away for the first couple weeks, walking home with his little brother Frank every day while their mom was working a double shift to pay the bills. One day, he simply didn't meet Frank to walk home and it took Frank nearly 12 hours to report his brother missing due to his mother's second job working nights at the bar. I was cleared very quickly of any suspicion since I had only come into the state a month prior, and I wasn't mentally able to deal with the conversation of Phil not being real. They talked it up to hearing from someone else at school and launched an investigation. This, of course, yielded nothing. Phil had been stuffed into a crawl space behind the supply closet in the class. They still don't know how he got there, or if someone put him there. Rumors spread that he'd simply fallen asleep and gotten stuck. I wanted so badly to believe them, and so did everyone else. But the look of abject horror in his mummified face half-caved-in skull and tear marks on his trademark flannel betrayed that theory entirely. I moved schools again soon after and went a few miles south to an all-girls school. Socializing became something I struggled massively at, but Frankie helped with that. Understanding one another's grief brought us close, and inevitably we ended up together now looking at starting a family of our own in this town. 
that still carries on the tradition of No Name November. I think about Phil's fate a lot. How someone who was forgotten by the town at the age of 13 was able to successfully vanish overnight. I think about how powerful a name and an identity can be to someone in a world where it's so easy to slip under the cracks through your own volition or someone else's. And as I look over a sea of unmarked graves in my town, I think of how lucky I am to have had someone like Phil guiding me. To ensure I survived my own no-name November. To ensure I wasn't forgotten, too. I hope you enjoyed No Name November, as written by T.J. Lee and voiced by Heather Thomas and Vaden. Be sure to check out T.J. on Amazon, where you can find pre-order information for his newest novel, The Spaces in Between, which is the second entry in the Strangeness in Sturgeon series, releasing October 30th, 2021. Sully Renshaw runs a most unique bar in the entertainment district of Sturgeon, one where you don't pay for the unusual drinks with money, but with stories. Many come and go, but someone interesting wanders in one day and changes Sully's life forever. With his loyal companion Cheddar, Huntress Nell Lockwood, and the vivacious hedonist Kraus, Sully must fight against the deadly Order of the Void and find out why on earth their mysterious leader wants the bar. Secrets will be revealed, dangerous drinks spilled, and untold horrors will burst into the bar. Now complete with fresh tales, The Spaces in Between is the second in author T.J. Lee's Strangeness and Sturgeon Echoes series that started with The Last Sin Eater, and new entries in this universe will be released throughout 2021 and beyond. If you enjoyed Heather's performance, you can hear more of her right here on our official YouTube channel, as well as on the amazing Creepy Podcast, where several of her vocal performances are available for your enjoyment. If you check her out, be sure to give her a thumbs up and leave a kind word and tell her you heard her here on this program and that Steve sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark.